Hello, um, good evening from London and whatever, good afternoon or morning, wherever you are. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Mohammed Ahmedullah, the Secretary of Brickland Circle. Um, thank you for joining this uh, today's talk. Um, it's been given by Khalid Hussain. I won't say much about him. His details are actually on the uh, you know publicity that we generated, and you, I think you have, you have seen or you still have. Um, I will just say a few words very quickly about my own personal. Uh, sorry, the title of today's plight of the Bihari community in in, in Bangladesh. Um, I will just say very briefly my personal experience uh, with the Bihari community, and then I'll pass on to Khalid. He will speak sure, for sure. about um, um, half an hour or 40 minutes or so. Then uh, there'll be a chance for Q&A, and uh, anybody want to share something or comment. Um, so I came to London you know, in 1973, when I was about under 10 years old. Um, in my village, which is about 25 miles from Dhaka city, uh, north. Um, there's an orphanage, you know, my family, my grandfather started the orphanage. And that's where I first met uh, two Bihari boys, you know, young boys. And uh, during the war, 71, they kind of disappeared. Probably it wasn't safe for them, you know, to stay in the village in, in, in the context. Uh, so we didn't see them, you know, they were our close friends. And after the liberation, me and my brother and few, I mean, two other young boys, we were walking from Gulistan to Modumita Cinema Hall. And suddenly a guy appeared and, uh, you know, from behind and held on to my brother's eye slides and told that to, us to keep quiet. So this was one of the Bihari boys, his name was Shahabuddin. So it was so nice to see him safe. Uh, but he told us, uh, you know, not to say, not to call him Bihari or anything like that, because the atmosphere, you know, after the liberation wasn't a very, you know, positive uh, for, for uh, Bihari people in, in Dhaka. Uh, especially non-concentration areas. Um, then when we came to London, about a year or two later, we received a letter from uh, Karachi saying that Shahabuddin wrote a letter to us saying they arrived in Karachi you know, safely. And we've never heard anything from them again after that. Hopefully they're still all right, alive. Uh, in, in Bangladesh, you know, we moved to Dhaka city uh, my brother used to stay in Dhaka city. I used to stay mostly in the village. And my brother used to go to Nawapur Government High School, which is in all part of Dhaka. And that school had a lot of Bihari students. At the end of the 60s, things were very tense you know, between Bengalis and Biharis. And my brother used to come often home, say, this fight between Biharis and Bengali kids. And sometimes the school used to be shut down because of the violence. Um, and then, you know, the war came. Um, and the Bihari people, you know, they were in a really impossible situation. Uh, they left India to, you know, because of violence and, and fear. And they came to Bangladesh, East Pakistan that time, and that became a nightmare. And then Bengali nationalists and Bengalis were fighting for their rights against the Pakistani domination. And the Biharis were in the middle, scapegoated, and they had nowhere to go. And nobody ever tried to empathize with them. You know, Bangladeshi people always blame them for being supporter of Pakistani collaborators and things like that. But nobody has tried to empathize with them. It's really important that, you know, we empathize with minorities because they are sometimes in a very impossible situation, impossible position. Um, so I'll pass on to Khalid and then hopefully we'll take some questions after uh, he finishes. Thank you, Khalid. Thank you. Uh my name is Khalid Hussain. I belong to the Bihari Urdu speaking linguistic minority. I'm chief executive of Council of Minority. Uh, so I have a, a small presentation about the history of the Bihari. So I will request you, Yamadullah, please start my presentation. Please share the slide. Just uh, one second. Sure. Wait, just uh, one second. Sure, sure. Just 
trying to say which one. Just hold on a second. Sorry about this. Can you see? Yep. Okay, you may start. Yeah, thank you. So uh, this is a story of migration, citizenship, statelessness, citizenship, social, legal, and political exclusion of the Bihari. You can see some pictures. It's, it's about in the Mohammedpur camps. Please change the slide. So, uh, as I say, I belong to the Bihari Urdu speaking linguistic minority and formerly a stateless person of Bangladesh. So, this picture you are seeing uh, on the screen, this is called is Geneva Camp. It's very recent uh, structure of the camp before the camp was made by bamboo and hovel type, you know, the houses. But the people are living uh, uh, since 1972. So, uh, their population is going, growing, but they have the very little space. So they are just uh, grow up like an unstructural, uh, uh, unstructural building. So next, next slide, please. Before 5th May 2003, I consider as a stateless because, next slide, because subcontinent 1947 subcontinent created the historical creation of India and Pakistan. Next slide. So it was the mass migration of uh, Hindus, Muslims, and Sikh community. So our community we belong from the Bihar, the Indian state of the Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, and the West Bengal. A good number of Urdu speaking community they migrated to East Pakistan. Now is in in Bangladesh and a good number of the Hindu community, they migrated to Bangladesh, to India. And then there is another migration with the Sikh community like uh, Amritsar to Lahore, Lahore to Amritsar. Next, please. So uh, during the Pakistan period, this Urdu speaking community was the privileged community just because of their language and culture. And within that, that 24 years of Pakistan period, the Pakistani government and the politician, they wanted to uh, segregate this Bihari community and they wanted to use Bihari community as a pocket, as a political pocket. So that when they established the, uh, the Bihari colony, it was very separated, like in Muhammadpur and Mirpur, there is no any, any Bengali intimation with on that time. Next, please. So, it was completely political will of the Pakistani government and the politicians. They just used the Bihari community as a as an ally of the Pakistani army. In 1971, a section of Urdu speaking community, they opposed the creation of Bangladesh and they supported to the army. But it was a very few people for that, you know, the during the war and after the war, uh, the Bihari were killed by the Bengalis and their property has been looted and they become stateless. Next slide. So when, when they just uh, uh, lost their property and houses, then ICRC came in 1972 and they built 116 camps all over in Bangladesh. That camp was just for the time being because uh, after 16 December, 1971, the Bengalis started killing of the Biharis. So they just, they just tried to live together within the refugee camp. Next, please. So since 1972, uh, we had so many nomenclature, like after uh, 71, the war, after the end of the war, the Bihari become uh, uh, like non-Bengali, stranded Pakistani, Mohaji, refugee, but underlying assumption where they are not Bangladeshi. Next, please. So we have 116 camps all over in Bangladesh. The camps are in Muhammadpur, Mirpur, Adamji, Narayanganj, Maman Singh, Khulna, Bogura, Rangpur, Saitpur, Ishurdi, and Chittagong. An estimated total population of 300,000. 
but we don't have any comprehensive data of the Biharis because uh, no one ha has been working on this this data issue. But we are assuming the 300,000 population are inside 116 camp. Next, please. So we have ended our statelessness. Like in 2001, uh, we 10 uh, youth from Geneva camp, including myself, we decided uh, we are, we are by born Bangladeshi citizen, but our name is missing in the voter list. So first time in 2001, we filed a repetition in high court and we claim ourselves as a Bangladeshi citizen. We didn't say we need citizenship. We say we are Bangladeshi citizen. We are by born Bangladeshi, but we are living in Geneva camp and we speak Urdu. We are not Bengali. We are Bihari people. So just one year after one year in 5th May, 2003, the court declared that this 10 petitioner from Geneva camp, they are by born Bangladeshi citizen and Geneva camp is in the territory of Bangladesh. So living in the Geneva camp is not affected their citizenship. So first time we just received our voting rights, court has instructed to the election commission to include our name in the voter list. So after this judgment, to instruction from the high court to the election commission, election commission came in Geneva camp and they enlisted our name in the voter list, but just for the 10 people, not for the all. So it was the mistake of our petitioners. So we didn't say we all Biharis are living in 116 camps. We are Bangladeshi citizen and we want to include our name in, in, in voting rights. So in 2007, when the Bangladesh government started launching a national ID card first time and, and, and they announced if you have national ID card, you will enjoy these and that uh, opportunities and, and, and things. So we, we just thought we 10 people got nationality. We 10 people enroll our name in the portal list, but not others. So it will be really disaster for the other Biharis, those are living in the camp. Then the another group from Mirpur, they filed another writ petition in 2008. And on that petition, we claim that we are Bihari and living in 116 camps. We all are Bangladeshi citizen and we want to include our name in the voter list and we want national ID card. So the, in the same year, 18th May 2008, the court declared that Urdu speaking people are living in 116 camps. They are Bangladeshi citizen. And the first time the court has decided our nomenclature, like Urdu speaking Bangladeshi. Next, please. So you can see the picture of uh, the camps, basically, uh, all the camps are like refugee-like camps, very small places, and so many people are living together. Mostly the houses are 10 to 10 feet houses, and the people are living 8 to 10 people. You can see the picture on the right-hand side. The top picture is in every houses, you can see the high bed, and the people are using the bed, uh, I mean, uh, inside the bed, because uh, at the night time, so many people are living together within this 10 to 10 feet house. They don't have any extra space for cooking or washing or anything. Every, for every family, the wash system is, is, is for outside. Inside the camp, there is uh, uh, around, uh, like in Geneva camp, I can say uh, 250 uh, toilets for uh, almost 30,000 people. And you can see uh, the laundry system inside the camp is very dirty and, and the drinking water is not safe. Next, please. So uh, like in 2008 to till it's around uh, 13 years, but we don't have, uh, we don't receive any benefit of the citizenship. Like we are citizen without any benefit. So when we realize after 2008, we are citizen, but we are not, eligible to get passport, birth certificate, national ID card. So then we started a paralegal project in 2013 in June. And we trained the 10 paralegals from uh, five cities of the camps and the paralegal started outreaching in the camp and they motivated, they mobilized the community people and they disseminated the message of 2008 High Court judgment. And because it was the long story uh, living without citizenship so we, 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 all the camp dwellers, we just determined we are not Bangladeshi citizen. We are a stranded Pakistani. We have go back to Pakistan. And even the same situation with the government department and the local people, they assume the camp dwellers are not Bangladeshi citizens. 
they are stranded pakistani they are not national they are not local people so when we started this project initially uh, we easily got uh, the birth certificate but the passport passport has been rejected uh, in the name of the camp address you know in bangladesh the system if you have the national id card and the birth certificate then you are eligible to apply for apply for the passport so once a bihari from the camp if they apply for the passport we don't have any permanent address the camp address is the permanent address so we have to put the present address and the permanent address as a camp address so once they just see the sb officer special branch officer there is written the camp address then they make a phone call and they say no biharis are not eligible to get the passport because you don't have the electricity bill you don't have any permanent address or you don't have any any property then our paralegal started negotiating with the sb officer some sb officer said okay uh, we have the written statement from the home ministry that the biharis and rohingyas are not eligible to get the passport then i just talk with the sb officer and i say how can you say the bihari they have the national id card we have the birth certificates we are not refugee we are bangladeshi national so you can't merge with the uh, the rohingya community then they say okay you just you just go and challenge to the home ministry because we have the written statement and then we say no we are bangladeshi citizen next please then in 2000 next slide then in 2015 i myself uh, filed a petition under information right to information act and i simply asked to the home ministry we are urdu speaking living in the camp we have the national id card are we eligible to get passport or do you have any policy to provide passport to the biharis so i got just after one month i got a, a six pages order you can see right hand side and and on that order they have written the standard pakistanis those have the national id card they are eligible to get the passport so with this support with this order we just have reapply our rejected passport next next slide rejected passport and the first time we got two passport with the camp address and then again when we applying the passport then again this passport has been rejected because the sb officer said you have the order but i don't have this home ministry order and you don't have any permanent address so you are not eligible to get the passport so still the bihari's passport has been rejected if you if we are paying the bribe and we are using the false address then you can get the passport so some like some you those are uh, you know are trying to go as a migrant worker in 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 middle east or in in malaysia what they are doing to get passport with the fake address so on their passport there is a fake address there is no any any permanent address or any any present address next slide please so again uh, the biharis are in the risk of the statelessness you know in 2016 the cabinet has been approved a draft citizenship bill and the bill is completely controversial bill there is so many so many articles is 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 you know uh, 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 the controversial if this bill will be enacted in the parliament then again the bihari community will be statelessness because uh, in 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 the section 3 the bill say this bill will be the supermessy bill and before all the judgment and degree will be null and valid so basically the our judgment our citizenship come through with the judgment so if this bill will be enacted from the parliament then again the bihari will be a stateless community next slide please so when we came to know about this bill then we started uh, working on this bill with the support of unscr we organized a workshop and 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 we drafted a recommendation on each section of the bill where is the gap and 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 what should be what should be changed and review the bill and then we organized a press conference and the live radio show you can see the senior senior advocate hasan arif was there and we all we all tried to make a good draft next slide please so you can see uh, even even uh, we have uh, Uh, do advocacy international level in 2018 uh, we have submitted the upr universal periodic review uh, in un and we have submitted the issue of the bill and then we have raised the issue in 2018 in the forum on the minority issue 
Next slide, please. So you can see here is the recommendation and we have submitted, uh, we have submitted this recommendation to National uh, Human Rights Commission and then Law Commission and the Law Ministry. The, we have received a letter from the Law Ministry and the Law Ministry, uh, uh, Law Commission and the Law Commission say this is the wonderful recommendation and we are trying to talk with the government to review the bill before enacting in the parliament. So still uh, uh, we are in dark, we don't know uh, where is the bill now and, and when it is, it is coming on the parliament, if this bill is going to uh, in the parliament without any reviewing, then it will be disaster for the speaking community. So I, I just want to mention here some uh, dramatically change uh, within last two months, you know, in September, we have received a letter from, uh, uh, from BBS Bangladesh Bureau of Statistics. There is written uh, the security, security department, they have instructed to the BBS to conduct a household survey of the Biharis in each and every district. And then they will, they will raise the issue internationally and international forum to push back them to Pakistan. So this is very recent in, in September, 2021. The government is trying to make a database of the Biharis and they will raise this issue in internationally and they will create the pressure to the Pakistani government to take back to the, all the Biharis. But I don't know why they are doing this. And even in October 17, you know about uh, the prime minister of Bangladesh, uh, she gave a statement in front of the Netherlands High Commission. Uh, she said, the Rohingya and standard Pakistanis are burden in the Bangladeshi economy. So this, this two thing is completely shocking for us. We are Bangladeshi citizen. We have national ID card, each and every camp. If you visit, you can find 95% people, they have the national ID card. Then how can the government push back to Pakistan? Or how can the prime minister say uh, they are national, they are burden in the national economy? Next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. If you have any question, please. Thank you, Khaled, uh, for this um, wonderful, informative um, presentation. Um, I think before um, I allow question, I just want to take the advantage of my position as sure. a chair to ask you one piece of clarification. <clears throat> what I wanted to ask you, you know, you mentioned that uh, when after the partition of India, when Biharis came to East Bengal, the Pakistani authorities deliberately separated them. Now, exactly. was it a deliberate policy to create a Bihari enclave? Uh, or was it just uh, something practical that they needed, you know, open space to house a lot of people from a region, right? And, you know, it was difficult to place them within the that time, you know, uh, Dhaka city and other places. Mm -hmm. If so, if it was a deliberate policy, then what's the evidence? I think uh, like what, what we have come to know about uh, uh, the rehabilitation of the Mohajir in Mirpur and Mohammedpur area. So where I'm sitting right now, it's called the Ajij Mohalla. And it was just uh, 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 allocated by the Bihari uh, the, all the plots allocated by the Bihari. So on that time, there will be no any Bengali people. So the Pakistani government, they decided uh, they are living far away, like thousand miles far away. And, and, and they had the fear of, uh, of India, you know, all the time. So they just try to try to use the Bihari people as their ally. So they wanted to always they wanted to always segregate it to the Biharis with the Bengali people. So that, you know, uh, like, like all the Biharis in Mirpur, they all living together. There were no any mixing with the Bengali community. If they live together with the Bengali community, then the massacre will be less. So many Bihari have been killed after and during the war. So if they live together, they can make the friendship, they can make the neighborhood. But the Pakistani government, they wanted to segregate them. What's, what's the evidence that they did it deliberately? Because sometimes, you know, uh, you have to house a lot of people and people come from a particular region. So you have to house them like together so they can get on with each other. But you know, like I was saying earlier, uh, that uh, 
uh, in Navapur government high school, there were a lot of Biharis, you know, who mm -hmm. came, came from yeah. India. So there right. were all the Biharis were not segregated, you know, into uh, camps. Mm -hmm. You know, many were living uh, among the among the Bengalis. So I think what we need to be careful is that we can speculate, you know, but do we have evidence that this was a deliberate policy to yes. create a kind of enclave so they can use them? Mm -hmm. uh, I think we I will ask go to the audience. Anybody want to ask any questions or comment? Uh, yes, Ahmedullah, if you would um, allow me, I would like to ask one or two questions. Yes, Please. yes. Uh, thanks, thanks for the short presentation. Um, uh, I was uh, I just want a bit of elaboration from the speaker on the um, on on the verdict High Court or Supreme Court, whatever um, um, the court was, May two thousand and eight, that said um, uh, Urdu speaking uh, Bangladeshi, you know, so called Biharis are actually Urdu speaking Bangladeshis. Uh, uh, did the um, order or the High Court judgment made it clear? Was it people who are born after 75, 71, or was it for uh, include? Did it include everybody, um, i.e., those who migrated, you know, since you know uh, forty seven or before or prior, or did it make it specific? It's only for those who are um, after 71. Basically, my point is, was it universal rather than a very limited and very narrow uh, definition of who can be a citizen? My second question would be, um, wh what are the political identity of the bear of, of uh, Urdu speaking Biharis or Bangladesh, whatever you want to call them, um, in terms of do they, um, do they have like a uh, uh, you know, Islamic uh, kind of identity based on 47 notion of separate homeland for Muslims and whatnot, or, um, you know, their political identity, of, or I'm talking of the current, uh, you know, um, the speaking uh, uh, minorities in Bangladesh. Um, is it like they engage in political activities or political engagement with secular parties like BNP, Army League? Uh, basically, I'm trying to um, get an idea, you know, of what their political identity is and if they engage politically. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, the first question is uh, regarding the judgment. So 2008 judgment is very much clear. And uh, on the judgment, they didn't say about like any category. The judgment said uh, the, the people, those are living in 116 camps, they all are Bangladeshi citizens. But one observation is the court say, uh, if someone claim himself or hums, herself as a standard Pakistani, court said, leave them on their faith. That means if any camp dealers, they don't want to include their name in the voter list and they can say, I'm a standard Pakistani, I want to go back to Pakistan, the court say, leave them on their faith. So there is no any category. All the people are Bangladeshi citizens according to 2008 court judgment. Like you can see, we have 95% people living in the camp, they have the national ID card. Even uh, those are 60 plus or 55 years old, they have the national ID card. So there is no any barrier. Uh, for after or before 71. The other question is uh, regarding the political identity. I mean, uh, like uh, at the beginning, from the beginning, the Piharis are not engaged with any Islamic parties. Basically, they are uh, just a supporter of BNP and Awami League. And now the situation is in the most area like Sadpur, in Sadpur, North Bengal, uh, all the councillor they, they win with the vote of the Bihari, the, all the Awami leaguers. So, so most of young generation, they are directly involved with the party of Awami League and, and, and they, are, they, are, they are working with some uh, BNP, but not, no one uh, uh, supporter of the Jamaat Islami. This is the good thing with the Biharis. They are, they are not supporter of the Jamaat Islami. Either they are with the BNP or the Awami League, even not with the Jatiyo party. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comment? Hello, Peter, you always ask questions. Uh, um, Yasmin, I think Yasmin wants to ask questions. Yes, thank you so much. And I'm so glad to be able to join this um, Zoom conversation. Uh, Advocate Hussein, I have a kind of a question about, have you looked at the Indian uh, new citizenship law that has been passed 
with the CAA compared to the yes. citizenship law of now Bangladesh right. of 2016, because yes. in India, they're trying to make Bengali speaking Muslims into Bangladeshis. And I'm hearing right. what you're saying is Urdu speaking yes. Bangladeshis have become Pakistanis. So yes. I'm kind of curious about this very common theme running across the subcontinent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we are very much worried after seeing this 2016 uh, draft citizenship bill issue because this bill is completely dangerous bill for Urdu speaking as well as the war criminals. Basically, on that bill, uh, they just targeted the war criminal people. So, so many sections that say uh, if if you belong directly with the Pakistani ally, your citizenship will be uh, non invalid. So uh, like, uh, like CAA and, and this draft citizenship bill, somehow we are uh, fear with this connection or something. We are also very much uh, uh, in fear. I think we got, uh... oh yes, Christopher. Yes, uh, good evening from Ravel Pindi. I'm Christopher Sheriff. I just wanted to ask uh, one or two things. The first is that within the camps, if I may ask, what are the means of income of the people living in the camps? And if they are just depend, either they are dependent only on the UN or are they working outside also and contributing to the Bengali economy? Okay. And the second thing is, ke, uh, are they on a self-motivation basis ghettoized in the camps? Or is it the other majority that is forcing them that they cannot leave the camps and live among other people in Bangladesh. Okay, thank you for your question. So nowadays, there is no any support from UN agencies or, or from any government. All the people, they have the access to go out the camp and they can earn. Mostly the Biharis are barber, rickshaw puller, handicraft worker, and butcher. And some people are automobile technicians and they are pretty, Pity businessmen like inside the camp they have the battle shop they have the tea stall they have the restaurant they have the hotels so there is no any barrier to to go out the camp or earn money and basically the all the biharis are really contributing on the economy of the bangladesh because we are not getting any support from the un un agency or any really from the government they are managing their own economy and most of people you know like nowadays uh, a good number of the Urdu speaking diaspora community, they are living in UK and US. They are providing educational support. And so many, so many young from the camps, they have educated and now they, they, are, they are coming out from the camp. So almost uh, 10 to 15% population, they, they already moved from the camp. And, and, and they have rented their camp house to the local Bengalis. So each and every camps, if you move, you can find 10 to 15% Bengali low income bengali people are living there so so good thing has been started and integration is also good you know now the biharis are integrating with, with like intermarriages is going uh, very high so many bihari marriage to the bengali bengali girls and bengali boys are i mean it it has been started intermarriage has been started yes uh, just one small thing sorry i'm asking yeah. another question yes please and please, please. Uh, is there, can you uh, share the slight ratio of the Urdu speaking community working in the government or in the armed forces? No, within no one. No, no, no one. There is the problem, you know. Uh, we are just trying to work on the civil documentation issue also as well as for the government services issue. So the issue of the government services, when we apply for the government services, they qualify written exam they qualify viva when the investigation officer investigate uh, 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 their address then they have uh, seen the camp address then they have been rejected so we are not in the government services even not in the police and army there is a still there is a still barrier thank you thank you very much i want to point out uh, one important contribution of biharis <coughs> to bangladesh is um, they came with uh, very, you know, unique weaving skills. Exactly. Um, and in uh, in Mirpur area, they set up, uh, you know, what what was called Benarasi sari making, you know, weaving. Benarasi sari making. And 
you know, it's very popular in Bangladesh, but they've changed the name from Banarasi to Mirpur Katan now. Uh, but I still like calling it Banarasi because it's nice. Would you like to say something about, because when I went to interview some people, I found a lot of uh, young Bangladeshis were actually working in the, we, you know, in the, in the looms now, you know, so originally it was yeah. mainly Biharis. So a lot of Bangladeshis are going. So there's been like skills transfer from Biharis to the Bangladeshis. Could you say something about that, please? Yeah, I just, I have seen some, uh, some message. Yes, the Biharis are, uh, Bihari can move the camp anytime if, if their economy support them. So there is no any barrier, but sometimes, you know, uh, they face some discrimination, social stigmas. If a Bihari family come out from the camp and they wanted to rent an apartment, so the apartment owner, if they assume uh, they are Bihari or, uh, or they are from the camp, they, they deny to rent the apartment because they say, you know, the Bihari people, you have the good, uh, I mean, the large family and you re your relatives are living in the camp. So once you enter in this apartment, so so many Bihari people coming out and your language is different. So this type of stigmas we are facing, but legally we don't have any problem to go out the camp. Uh, regarding the Benarashi, Benarashi is one of the very unique skill of the Biharis. So nowadays this business has been down just because of the Indian, uh, Indian market. So, so now you can get the Indian shari, very cheap price. So if any Bihari making weaving uh, the Benarashi shari, it will take very higher because they have to go through with their skill and, and, and the hand looming, but Indian saris are very cheaper. So now all, most of the Benarasi workers, they are going to change their profession. Most of uh, uh, the Benarasi uh, uh, workshop has been closed and the Benarasi workers are, they have changed their profession. They are going to be uh, work as a barber or the hawkers. So these are the problem with this industry. Someone wants to know you, Bihari. Khaled, someone asking, are you Bihari? Yeah, yeah, I'm Bihari. Yeah, my my forefather belonged from Patna, Bihar. I born in Geneva camp, yeah, in 1981. Peter, you always ask questions. You always have something to ask. Yeah, I did. I did. When I was in Bangladesh in the, in the early 90s, I lived in Mohammedpur and I, I was aware of the mm -hmm. Bihari camps, but I didn't have anything to do with that. What, what's the relationship in places like Mohammedpur or Mirpur between Bengali and Bihari or Urdu speaking people in, who are neighbours within a mile or so? What kind of relationships have developed over the years? Is, 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 have the relationships improved mm. now? You did say that people are working outside the camps. Yes. Now, nowadays, the relationship is building uh, very good because as now a good number of youth, they are working in, I mean, they are studying in school and university. They are making friendship with the Bengalis and a very good number of skilled Biharis, they are, they are serving to the Bengalis. So you can find so many barbers in, in Dhaka. If you visit any barber shop, you can find any one or two Biharis. Uh -huh. So the relationship is going to very, very good with our economy, with our mm -hmm. skill. So never it is, is, is going to be established. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And have they had, have Biharis had good educational opportunities? I mean, there's some very good schools in the no, no area. Do, I mean, we don't have like separate school or something. We have to go through with the government primary school or private school. And have they been able to get? Have they been able to get education through the government yeah. system? Yeah, through the okay. government system. Yes. Good. Yeah. Okay. I think Romana Kabir wanted to ask something. Are you still? Your hands was up. It's gone down now. Romana, can you hear? Okay. Uh, Khalid, could you say a little bit about your educational journey, please? Okay, so I just say I born in Geneva camp and I started my primary school in the camp school. It's still the camp school is alive there. It's called non-local junior high school. It was class eight, just class eight. And then after class eight, you have to go out from the Bengali school. So once in, in 2094, 1994, 
uh, we we 20 students from Geneva came. We completed our class eight standard, and then we entered in the Bengali medium high school in Nur Jahan Road. The first time we entered in the Bengali school, and inside the camp school, you know, uh, we just we just study. We don't have any any practice to to sing a, a national anthem. So once we entered in the school, the Bengali school, the first time we in the raw, and uh, all the kids are just uh, singing the national anthem, Amar Sonar Bangla, but we didn't because we don't have any any, any practice with this uh, with this song. So once we just come back in the classroom, then the, all the Bengali students, they start, uh, I mean, uh, funny talking and they start teaching us, I mean, uh, uh, like if teaching or something. Then next day we have start fighting with them. And then within a week, 15 students has been dropped out. And they say, no, we are not going to continue my education with this school. And somehow we four or five uh, continue our education. And then I, I, I pass my SSC examination, metric examination. And then I enter in uh, Mohammedpur Central University College for my graduation. And after that, I realized uh, when I completed my business graduation, then I realized I need to work for my community so that I need to know the national laws. Then I started studying in the law school and I qualified in 2006. And in 2000, 2010, I enrolled myself as an advocate in Bangladesh Bar Council. So now we still I'm working for their citizenship rights, youth development and women development issues. Anyone else want to say something or ask any questions? Hello, Mohammed, if I may. Yes, of course. Hi. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, you know, like for minority ethnic groups from the Chittagong Hill Tracks, there are quota systems for the government, uh, various recruitment drives. Is there nothing like that for the Bihari population? Because I would, I would um, suspect that, you know, being a vulnerable group, being a group that um, faces such discrimination, that there ought to be a, a system of quotas for recruitment. No, for the Bihari, we don't have any quota in education or in the services. Even very strange thing is, you know, like the other minorities, like untouchable people, we say Dalit. For mm -hmm. Dalit, for indigenous community, they have a specific budget. Every year, the government, they, they, they set the budget for the Dalit community. They set the budget for uh, the hill tracks people, but they, they, didn't, they didn't say anything for the Bihari. We don't have any a special budget for our like sanitation or the camp development, nothing. It would seem to me that this is an area to campaign on because it's it's uh, exactly glaring, uh, you know, uh, um, what do you call it? It's just it's it's not right, is it? It's a gap. It's in a service. huge gap. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Thank you. But can you do that, given that there is a long history, particularly with 1971, of the so-called betrayal of the Biharis mm -hmm. to the formation of Bangladesh? So do you, how would you re-narrativize your story? I mean, uh, after 71, like- No, because uh, this, the history of the Bihari community in Bangladesh is fraught mm -hmm. in this political kind of problem, right? Of the birth exactly. of Bangladesh, right? So right. now how do you claim yourself as a disempowered minority mm -hmm. that deserves the state um, recognition and state support? Yeah, this is the challenge, you know, like uh, because we did like a section of people did a very bad thing they will oppose the creation of Bangladesh so that the Biharis are very sensitive minority in Bangladesh. If you ask any local people in front of the Bihari, they can show you sympathy. But after that, they say they are the collaborator. They are, uh, I mean, uh, the helper of the Pakistani army. So, so this is completely worse. Even in the government system, they don't want to, they don't want to do anything for the Biharis. If you just, uh, if, if you shock, if you see so many NGOs are in Bangladesh, they are the big NGOs, 
but they don't have any funding for the Bihari issue. They can work with the slum dealers, they can work with the another slum, but very few NGO, they have the kind support for the Bihari community. So it's still, you know, this community is a very sensitive community just because of the empty role of 1971. I think Romana wanted to ask something. Are you still there, Romana? Hello, Romana? Okay, Christopher, did you want to ask something? Sorry, oh, sorry. Uh, please, please, after you. After yeah, you. Uh, sorry, it's just bedtime, so I had to <laughs> attend to my son's need. Uh, first of all, thank you for organizing this event. And also, I heard about you, Khaled Pai, because my background's architecture. And I just want to reflect on my experience when I grew up in Bangladesh. We had this lady who we used to call Bihari Bua, a lady who used to work in our house during the 80s. She worked right. in our house for over 30 years. And um, she, she and her brother and her son, although her son was born in Bangladesh, just like you, Khaled Bhai, she, he, right. well, they were sent to um, Karachi in a plane by Biman. You know, the government sent them as a repra repatriation. And then repatriation. after a few months, they came back because they were just so accustomed in Bangladesh. And her son was a Bangladeshi citizen, mm -hmm. you know, although there was not any legal um, rights. And I just realized when I grew up that, okay, Bihar is not in Pakistan, Bihar is in India. So it's exactly. a very simple awareness that I just raised, I just experienced from being, being uh, able to hear the stories. And also this lady, her, um, uh, what's her, um, yeah, one of her son died. Uh, and then she was raising the uh, grand granddaughter. And this granddaughter, she was a Bangladeshi citizen and she had the education and then she worked in local NGOs. So I think that they integrated very well in Bangladesh, but I didn't know the legal issues. And what my question is now is that you mentioned that now they're trying to repatriate people again back in Pakistan, but Biharis are not Pakist from Pakistan. so. <laughs> it yeah. just doesn't make sense. So it, there is no logic exactly. behind it. So that is exactly. my, my reflection. So, I mean, nowadays, if you see, we have national ID card, we have too strong judgment. Then how can government plan to push back to Pakistan? Because there is nothing in Pakistan. I mean, their citizenship act is very much clear. Their constitution is clear. So we can't claim ourselves as a Pakistani national or so. Sorry, I have one more uh, question to add. Sure, please. Is that please. Um, regarding <clears throat> the land ownership, because our uh, Bihari Bua, she, she used to be um, uh, telling us that there is this Mohajan who is the landlord. So are mm -hmm. those landlords also ori Bihari origin or did they own the land or are these the Bengali uh, people who own the land in this um, I know that you are doing some interesting work with some Bangladeshi architects as well. So I'm just yeah, exactly. interested from my uh, architectural point of view to understand the land rights issues. So after 71, like all the Biharis, they, I mean, 99% Bihari, they lost their properties. So now they don't have any land. We are living in uh, the government land and some private owner's land as a camp. So camps are, is, is not our own property. The people are living just for the permanently. We don't have any papers or anything. So now we are just demanding rehabilitation from the government, Bangladesh government, because how can people living within the eight feet to 10 feet houses, like 10 to eight people living together. So this is really inhuman uh, life for the Bihari. So as we are Bangladeshi citizens, we are demanding, we need change the accommodation, adequate housing. This is really important. Very recently, we have started a project of CLT, Community Land Plus Project. We are targeting two camps, like Geneva camps and Adamji camps. We are just completed our survey, household survey, and we are trying to talk with the camp dealers. What type of rehabilitation do you want? And then we will move to the government. <clears throat> just want to point out one thing. You know, Bihar was part of the historical uh, province of Bengal right? Mm -hmm. uh, Mughal province, Bihar, uh, uh, Bangla, Bihar, Odisha. So they, they are also part of Bangla. 
you know, right. in, in that sense, right? So it's, it's very strange, um, you know, why, why such hatred exists and why it kind of continues. Um, any other question? Oh, so there's one more hand up. Oh, yes, Christopher, go on. Uh, I just want you to share a little bit about how the youth is coping with it. How the youth is coping with all this years and years and decades of discrimination and uh, pardon me but i hope they are not moving towards uh, radicalism no this is the good thing like uh, the biharis are very keep and quiet community in, in bangladesh like see <clears throat> if you see the camp situation it's completely worse but these people are completely hard worker they are just concentrating their their, their economy they're trying to get the education. You didn't find any news or any, any information from the government or, 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 or from the others that the Biharis are very aggressive. They are taking uh, uh, like, uh, like uh, weapons or something. No, so that all the Biharis are just, just trying to, to learn some skill and earn the money in Bangladesh. And they try to purchase some land and they try to come out from the land. So, so this this is the good thing, you know. Thank you. Khaled Zariyat is asking something on chat. Uh, say, are stateless Pakistanis considered to be Biharis? Uh, stateless Pakistan? No, I mean there is no any stateless community in Bangladesh right now. The Biharis are not stateless because uh, they are citizen according to judgment, and they have the national ID card. So you can't say stateless community as a Bihari, no. Oh yes, Christopher. I'm sorry, I keep on coming up with questions. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, there's a situation that happens in Pakistan with the Christians. I just want to ask you if an if it is a girl of the Urdu speaking community married mm -hmm. to a non-Urdu speaking community, I believe that must be taken easily by them. But what if the boy is from the Urdu speaking community and the girl is from the non-Urdu speaking community? How is it taken up in Bangladesh then? Uh, I mean, uh, in Bangladesh, the intermarriages are growing up and there is no any issue if the Bihari boys are married to the Bengali girls and the Bengali girls, are, I mean, the Bihari girls are married to the Bengali uh, uh, boys. So, so most of family, those are, educated family, they are coming out from the camp and they are really trying to make a relationship with the Bengali family, mostly. They don't want to uh, make a marriages with the camp girls. So even within the Bihari community, there is a two class of the, of the people. One class of the people living in the camp and the, another class of the people, those are coming out from the camp. They just think they are superior. They don't want to come back to the camp. Even they don't want to marry to the camp girls. Even they, do, they don't want to marry to their girls to the camp boy. So they are trying to hide their identity. Like you can see, it's very easy for the Bihari community. We are Muslim. We have the same religion. Uh, we have the same ethnicity. So if I hide myself as a, as a Bihari, then no one can trust me, uh, trace out me as a, as a Bihari. So if I say I am Bengali and I'm living outside camp, so it's very easy. So now the young generation, mostly the educated young generation, they are trying to hide their identity. And they say, why I say Urdu speaking Bangladeshi? There is no means to say Urdu speaking. If I say I am Bengali, then I will, I will be benefited. If I say I'm Urdu speaking, then outside camp, though I'm living outside camp, I will be in trouble in some time. So now, you know, we are going to lost our culture and language. Just those people are living in the camp. They are claiming we are Urdu speaking. We are practicing our Kawali. We are practicing our Moshaira. But, you know, those are living outside the camp. They just forget everything. They try to hide themselves. So they, so we can say that there is, a, uh, there is an identity crisis also. Exactly. exactly. Very right. strong identity crisis. Very strong. Yeah. Yes, Thank you so much. Sorry, I was busy taking notes. Um, given the situation, Khalid, that you have explained yeah. very well, it seems actually quite um, hopeful 
um, that's something it changing because when I first went to Bihari camps in 2001 and wrote my first piece on the Biharis, I, as a scholar, was very badly attacked, right? Exactly. That, uh, yeah, on that are, These, these <clears throat> are betrayers. In 2011, again, when I went back to the camp, I heard similar stories of people saying, we'll go to Kabarstan, but we'll never be considered Pakistanis nor Bangladeshis. Now it has changed a lot, what you exactly. have said. So it right. is very hopeful. And I think Bangladesh is taking a kind of a proactive stand in including mm -hmm. um, the Urdu speaking people in Bangladesh. What right. is the reason? Could you give me a reason why this transformation has happened in a matter of 20 years in a way? Uh, like the recent changes is completely shock for us. We, we just started talking with uh, some intellectuals. So why the government is rigid now, they want to push back to Pakistan. So somehow we come to know this is maybe we are in the trap of the South Asian politics. <clears throat> like somehow, as you know, uh, you know, the present government is uh, like they are uh, just good relation with the India. And sometime India want to create some pressure with the Pakistani government. So the Bihari issue is a good issue for them. So if they will raise the issue, that so many people are living in the camp. So why you are trying to uh, freedom of uh, Kashmir? So why you are not supporting to, the, to, to your own people? So all the time India try to make a, you know, uh, the example for the Biharis. So your citizens are living in the camp and you are talking about the Kashmir. So this type of issue, like we are in the South Asian trap, maybe. So that the Bangladeshi government is start talking to, to push back to Pakistan, and they are the burden in the economy. It's, it's really, uh, it's unfortunate for us. Mustak. Oh, thank you. Um, I was just uh, coming back to um, the issue um, Khaled was talking about um, uh, regarding language and, uh, and, the, and the practice of the language within the camp. I mean, I'm aware uh, that within the religious circle, especially in madrasas, Urdu language is regarded quite highly. And mm -hmm. uh, most people who go through the madrasa education system, they are really good um, uh, in terms of linguistic ability in Urdu language, in, in terms of being able to read and write and things like that. So within the country, um, you know, within the greater educational framework, um, there are practicing of Urdu language um, to the extent, you know, sometimes they give more importance to Urdu language than, than Bengali, uh, depending on the type of madrasa it is. So my, po my point is, there are kind of institutional um, kind of, um, um, how should I say, um, um, education, at least education, uh, education system, there are at least a set of educational uh, institutions where Urdu is is taught and learned very very well. Um, so I was wondering, uh, but it, within the camp, um, uh, as Khalid said, there isn't much of it. So I'm I'm just uh, wondering if you know um, the new generation of Urdu speaking, you know, Bangladeshis or Biharis, whatever you call them, are taking or studying in those madrasas, or in in order to kind of. Um, you know, retain their cultural heritage of language and whatnot. Very unfortunate. Like, uh, uh, a very few camp students are going to madrasa, and you said very truly, uh, before, like uh, five years ago, uh, all the madrasa, they, 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 they taught in, in, in the Urdu, but now, even in madrasa, it has been changed. So many translated books is available there. So Urdu is not going to uh, teach in, in Madrasa also. And regarding the Biharis, uh, the, like young generation, they are not really studying. Uh, even we don't have any scope to, to learn Urdu language. Because in the school, we don't have the Urdu language in the school. A very few like Urdu teacher are inside the camps. Those are very old person. They just give it a private tutor uh, in house to house, door to door, but you know, very less scope. So I think uh, within next 10 years, uh, the most of Urdu speaking youth, they just forget to speak Urdu language. Because if you see 
now we have like 30 to 35 urdu poets but before it was thousand so th these are uh, i mean the people are reducing uh, from their cultural practices mm. so this is really unfortunate one one question i would like to ask you because <clears throat> you know in bangladesh we had a language movement exactly and, and it was a uh, bangla versus urdu now right. um and that language movement generated a lot of hate for the urdu language you know in bangladesh mm -hmm. Um, what I'm thinking, you know, some of the kind of anti-Bihari feelings in Bangladesh uh, could be due to their association with the Urdu language. Urdu language, right. Yeah. Uh, exactly. So I think, I think so that dimension, uh, I mean, I haven't done any studies, but this is my observation and my intuition that there must be something to do with the language movement and Bengali's hatred for the Bangladeshi Bengalis hatred. I don't know about Indian Bengalis hatred for the Ing Urdu language and the association Urdu language with the Bihari people. That exactly. kind of makes them double. Um, exactly, big. exactly. That means our language is our killer. You know, our language is our killer. The hate is started from 1952. The language movement, basically. Anybody else? We still have got people. Oh, John. John, we can't hear you. Yeah, sorry. No, um, I, 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 this is a very delicate issue, so I hesitate to, inter uh, to um, contribute. But uh, it struck me uh, that this goes back to the development of nationalism in the 19th century, where nations in Europe were forged around language, and we can see now how disastrous that was, really. Um, because, you know, uh, therefore, linguistic minorities and other minorities get stigmatized because they're not seen as belonging to, to, to the nation. So I suppose it's more of a comment, you know, that in a way what's happening in Bangladesh is a kind of sequel to what we know um, emerging in Europe and to some extent, I suppose, been exported through the whole colonial experience. Anybody else? Oh, yes, Yasmin. Sorry, Ziarat actually had a very good question that why are, that why are all Urdu speaking people considered Biharis? In fact, when did this term Bihari get used and how did it achieve this kind of currency to attribute all immigrants from India um, to East Pakistan, later Bangladesh, to be Bihari when they were from Uttar Pradesh and from other parts of India. Exactly. Right. It's a wrong, uh, I mean, the Bihari is the wrong nomenclature because my wife is not Bihari. She belongs to Orisha. She is Uriya. So how can we say all the Biharis are like, uh, but a good number of the people from the Bihar so that the people say all are Bihari, but here is the people is from UP, Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, West Bengal and Odisha. So this is a, not a good nomenclature. So, so that the court said they are Urdu speaking Bangladeshi. Even uh, we ourselves, we are trying to establishing our nomenclature as a, as a language based. We are Urdu speaking. We belong the Bihar, we belong the Odisha, we belong the Uttar Pradesh. So the common thing is we have the Urdu, the language, so that we are trying to talk, I mean, trying to establish our own nomenclature as Urdu speaking Bangladeshi. So we, we all are not Bihari. It's very Yes, true. but if you're saying the Urdu itself is dying as a language, it's not exactly. being taught, people are not no. studying it. There is no right. literature developing. So how could you remain Urdu speaking when you don't even speak Urdu? Yeah, exactly. Like uh, if the camp will be finished and the once it will be rehabilitated in the mainstream society, then we didn't find any, any Urdu speaking community. They all become the Bengali because now the train has been started. The young generation, they said, if I say I am Bengali, I will be benefited. If I say I'm Urdu speaking, I will lost. I will lose many things. So I think 
for the sake of economy for the sake of good opportunity the people are becoming bengali so so you'd say that assimilation is better than uh, a plural diversity yeah i mean our community they are realizing no need to claim ourselves for this speaking the better is i say i am bengali i will get all the benefit if i say i am urdu speaking though i am educated though i am living outside the camp somehow i will be discriminated mm. so there is a fear within the community you know i think um, a lot of uh, even us you know in england a lot of people chose um uh you know the people make uh, choices you know different families different individuals uh, like some people change their name so they can get uh, job interviews and so on uh, i personally resisted but i know people who have uh, assimilated more um, i want to be a good citizen but i want to maintain my identity and contribute um, you know in different ways to the society where i live i think if there are no more uh, questions or comment uh, then maybe we can um, we can um conclude uh is there anybody else who want to say anything oh i think yes may want to say something i'm so sorry i'm dominating this conversation no, which i no don't problem. mean to but it's so interesting and there's so many parallels um the previous comment where you said the community the uh, urdu speaking or the bihari or the uh, urdu speaking Banglad uh, bangladeshi community are now wanting to assimilate to a point that they do not want their language or their culture to survive because it's, as you said, in a very instrumentalist way, you become Bengali. Um, mm -hmm. If you take history into account as a historian, I have to bring that story into the, to bear here. In the 1950s, when India was also reconfigured in the terms of linguistic states, the Bengali speaking people of Assam, where I'm originally from, declared the mother language to be Assamese. And that's Assam. how Assam became an Assa Assamese, official language became Assamese and became Assamese dominated. 50 <coughs> years later, the same people are now considered Bangladeshi because of the religion being Muslim. Okay. I am afraid that your struggle to become Bengali will continue to have those cracks that can never be mended. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a solution, except I am bringing history to bear here, to think how other, what are other ways of remaining plural and you know, a, a kind of secular country, Bangladesh, by including people without expecting them to annihilate themselves to a point that they disappear, but will be brought back again when there's a politics of discrimination that has to, you know, uh, identify people to bear the cross in future again. So you might want to look into the history of India a little carefully to see what happened to minorities when they tried to merge, but were never really mm -hmm. accepted. And just one thing, you know, Bengali nationalists always point out, point out the story of Modushudan Dotto as an example, right? Uh, it doesn't work, you know, when you try to be somebody, they don't really respect you. Um, Khalid, would you like to say the last piece? And then I think we'll conclude. Thank you for uh, uh, for this wonderful uh, talk. And I, I, I hope uh, somebody uh, at least understand about the situation of the Biharis. So maybe uh, you can raise uh, our voice from uh, from your side if you get any chance in any, any forum or any any international arena. So that will be the really good because this community is completely uh, sensitive community. So we need uh, uh, life with as like as a human being. The camp situation is very worse. Day by day is going down. So now we need education, skill development and come out from the camp and rehabilitate ourselves because we are not hoping with the government. It's, it's a huge uh, funding issue. So we are also trying to uh, give the education and skill development to the youth and trying to come out from the camp. So this this will be the only way. I mean, the education and skill development can only the weapon for the Bihari community to integrate in the mainstream society and start the human human uh, human life in our side. 
thank you amadullah bhai thank you khalid and good luck uh, for the future and also sadika good luck with the progress of the hill people you know um, <clears throat> and they have their own uh, different struggles uh, but good luck with the uh, you know bihari community i have personal uh, experience you know before i came to london with uh, biharis some you know a few biharis um and also you know the bangladeshi people bangladesh is uh, just like many other countries are moving forward you know progressing education economically mm -hmm. and they developing you know more and more confidence and they don't need to fear 300000 biharis you know speaking mm -hmm. urdu we should actually encourage and facilitate the biharis exactly. to maintain you know their identity and urdu language has a longer history than the biharis um, in bangladesh it actually has 4 500 years of history so urdu is a is a bangladeshi language you know from long time ago uh, so it's just knowing history and then um you know uh, how an understanding how politics uh, came different times to uh, create problems you know for for different people okay thank you very much and uh, please do join uh, our event and yes we will invite you again to speak yes soon <laughs> you gave a nice talk in 2012 okay thank you very much and see you thank everybody you thank you colleagues bye bye. bye 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 thank you thank you everybody thank you